Well, it's a privilege to be amongst you uh, this morning to bring God's word and to seek to encourage you to uh, see beyond your personal life and to see how God is sovereignly at work and how no work of Satan or man can thwart the work of God. I want you to turn to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 2. And we'll read a few verses from verse 1, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And there were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, and of the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Dear friends, we want to speak about the wonderful works of God and the wonderful word of God uh, that the Lord has blessed well, friends, I want to give some words of introduction, some words of, uh, about the history of uh, the believers in Iran and uh, the, w- uh, what the Lord is doing right now and some things regarding the work of the Persian Bible. Let me say some words of introduction. Friends, in October 2019, <clears throat> it saw the historic publication of the Persian New Testament by the Trinitarian Bible Society. Persian or Farsi is the primary language of Iran in its several different forms. uh, It is spoken by many millions uh, around the world in countries such as Afghanistan and uh, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan and also parts of Iraq. Uh, This vital publication, dear friends, resulted Uh, after uh, years of work of revision and translation. And uh, the the Persian speakers throughout the world um, are now being blessed by the word of God. And we could say that to be able to read the Gospels, to read about the words, the very words of Christ, it it has brought sinners to hear uh, and to receive the wonderful message of salvation in their own tongue, in an accurate translation. And this is all to the praise and glory of his grace, as we read in Ephesians 1 and verse 6. It is helpful, I believe, to um, give some historical background uh, to my country of birth uh, before speaking about the work of translation of the Bible into the Persian tongue. Um, Under its ancient name of Persia, uh, Iran has a powerful claim upon the interest and prayers of the Lord's people. You think about Cyrus, you think about Darius, you think about the involvement of these Persian rulers uh, with the Jews' return from Babylon. You have uh, the uh, Persepolis. Uh, When you think about Daniel, that's, that's where he was. Uh, you, uh, we have still the, the tomb of, of Daniel. 
There are tombs of Cyrus and Darius and such people uh, still in that land. You um, have the um, tomb of Mordecai and Esther still there with a large population of the Jews uh, that, that are there. This is a picture of Daniel's tomb that is still there. You can go and visit it. And um, I have to go through these, these images very quickly because of the time. But uh, these are still there. These are evidences that the scripture is a historical book as well. And, uh, and, and dear friends, when we think of these things, the, uh, the, 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 the tombs of these great kings that once existed, once spoke great words, they thought of themselves, many of them thought of themselves as great gods and great rulers. And what are they now? Where are they now? And yet, we have these prophets. Still, their, their uh, tombs are there. The words of those kings have perished. But the word of God, spoken by those prophets who were inspired by the Holy Ghost, they remain. And uh, the names of uh, Cyrus and, and Darius, they're only, they bring certain images in our minds. But the words of Daniel and Habakkuk and such people, they are everlasting, dear friends. Uh, friends, uh, much could be said about these things, but in, in, uh, before the Arab invasion, the Persian Empire was, um, was a very pagan land. It was a very new age land. And uh, in the United Kingdom and the West, Actually, these new age ideas that are very ancient, they have come to be a normal thing. As people perform all kinds of practices and believe all kinds of uh, postmodern ideas, they are, not, they are not new, they are not modern. They are the old paganism repackaged uh, and fed to the masses through the media. But friends, in 637, AD, when the Arab Muslim armies uh, conquered the Persian capital, since then the Shiite form of Islam has been the national religion. Uh, before that it was the Zoroastrian uh, religion and other pagan religions of Babylon. Uh, currently there is the estimate of uh, 77 million in population of Iran itself, and then of course you have to add to that Afghanistan and other other nations, but in Iran, they're generally 99% are nominal Muslims. I say nominal Muslim because there are, it is a, um, people have become very disillusioned, as I will come to um, uh, explain to you later on about the fact that how um, even now a printer, a Muslim printer, is willing to publish the New Testament in Iran, which is an amazing thing. But, dear friends, I don't know what my uh, slides are doing right now, but I, I don't think they, we are on the right page. But, uh, uh, but I think this is, this is where we ought to be. Um, <clears throat> from 1979, uh, since the time of the Islamic Revolution, the constitution of Iran is based on Islamic fundamentalism and a strict adherence to the Quran. Um, and people may look at things in, in the Middle East and hear matters about the media, uh, but as often is the case, the word of God is unseen by the world. Uh, the world doesn't see what God is doing oftentimes. They're blinded and they're willing, willingly ignorant of what God is doing. But in, in 1979, when the revolution took place, it established this hardline Islamic regime. And over the next two decades, Christians faced increasing opposition and persecution. All, all of the missionaries were, uh, were, were thrown out. Evangelism was outlawed, outlawed. The Bible in the Persian language, they were banned and soon became very scarce. And uh, several pastors were killed in those early days after the revolution. The church came under tremendous uh, pressure. And many feared that this small evangelical um, Iranian uh, church that was existing in those days would soon wither away and die. 
The same was thought in Cambodia in the, in the se uh, 1970s when uh, the Cambodian government was overruled and, and uh, communism came into power in Cambodia and millions were put to death. They thought the church will not exist, but when everyone went back again, uh, they found there were churches uh, that were, were there. You see, God's people will not perish because they are fed by the word of God, which does not perish. And so as long as there is the word of God, there will be the people of God as well. And so, uh, dear friends, that, that is exactly what has happened. The exact opposite of what the West thought as the missionaries came out of the country, the very opposite has happened. So despite the continual uh, hostility from the late 1970s until now, Irani Iranians have become uh, the Muslim people most open to the gospel in the Middle East. How did this happen? There were two factors uh, that have contributed to this openness. First, there is this violence in the name of Islam has caused widespread disillusionment with the regime and has led many Iranians to question their beliefs. And secondly, many Iranians, um, Iranian Christians have continued to boldly and faithfully tell others about Christ and to distribute his word in the face of persecution. Just a week ago, a man by the name of Muhammad, he was released um, by, by the Iranian uh, court. Uh, he had been imprisoned for over a month uh, without us knowing what has happened to him, but he was one of the chief men in the past year who has been distributing TBS literature uh, within Iran. And, uh, and yet, uh, we need to pray for such people because they have, they have suffered much and they don't have many of their family members who are supporting of them, but the Lord's people need to support them and pray for them. But um, as, as a result of what has been happening, more Iranians have become Christians in the last 20 years than in the previous 13 centuries put together since Islam came to Iran. In 1979, there were the, an estimate of around 500 evangelical Christians from a Muslim background in Iran. Today, uh, we cannot put a number on it. Uh, it, it and, and that shows the amazing work of God that has taken place. And uh, there are people who are speaking now that they're, they're in the millions. Now it is, you can actually walk in the streets of Tehran and there are usually some bookstalls, second-hand bookstalls. Now even you can find Bibles amongst those. I have friends who, who've gone and they've said, well, we can actually purchase Bibles on the streets uh, in the face of the government. Uh, and, and this is unheard of. It, it, we don't think about it. The, the media would portray a certain image of such things, but my friends, the last two years has shown to us what the media and establishment is like in, 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 in amongst us. And so we, we must move on. I have um, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, great uh, work that has been done in evangelism has been people like Ayatollah Khomeini and his band of people. They are the ones who in Iran have turned the Iranians away from Islam. Uh, and you might think this is, uh, this is crazy, but it is true. It is people like that that have turned many away. Uh, and, and so they, they have now something. They, they will not turn to such people, such clerics, but they are not turning away, sadly, to many, many things. But the, by the grace of God, they are being brought to face the, the claims of the gospel of our Lord as well. Well, <clears throat> friends, I want to say a few words about the, uh, the, the word of God in Persian. We, we could go back before the work of Henry Martin. There's a great history of, of various missionaries and various um, works of different societies to bring some portion of the scriptures into the Persian language and the various dialects of it, but uh, m many of us, we are familiar with this 
godly man, Henry Martin. From the early 19th century, Henry Martin's translation, assisted by um, a man called Mirza Sayyid Ali, dominated the fields, a field of Persian translation in, uh, of the New Testament. His translation is the uh, first complete Persian New Testament, translated directly from the received text um, from the Greek. Various versions and publications uh, followed suit after that. It was published, the first edition was published, I believe, in 1812. And uh, Henry Martin's life legacy and work was the Persian New Testament. He, he died at the age of 31 uh, in, in Turkey while he was returning home uh, to receive some aid for his health. He was a weak man in terms of his, his physical um, uh, his, his physical uh, sort of stature and, and uh, needs, uh, but the Lord used this weak man, this very sensitive man, uh, who was emotionally a very, very ser- sensitive young man. You can see it even from his, his image there. But uh, he was only a gospel minister, ordained minister, uh, for seven years. You think about what, by the grace of God and the power of the Spirit, can be achieved in seven years. And, um, and we m- must pray for not just capable men, but the work of the Spirit of God in those men. Uh, because without the, <clears throat> the Lord and His Spirit's work, we can have the most gifted of men, and they can achieve very little. And what they may do, it may perish. We can have gifted men, but if they fall into sin, the testimony is gone. And so, dear friends, something that I often feel that we need to pray for one another is this, to pray for a walk of holiness, consistency in our lives, in a society, in the Trinitarian Bible society, for us not to be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also not make shame of Christ uh, by, by falling into sin. I speak of myself here and knowing my own weakness. Um, much could be said about uh, uh, Henry Martin. There is another man by the name of William Glenn. He was sent out by the, um, uh, by the um, Scottish Presbyterian Church uh, in the 1800s too, in early 1800s. He went to Russia and other places. And uh, as I have read, that he, he was walking once in the streets of uh, St. Petersburg, and he... Um, met an Iranian Jew uh, who, um, who said that um, he, has, he doesn't know the scriptures because he doesn't have the Old Testament in the Persian language. And so he was convicted. He said he must tr- learn the Persian tongue and then to translate uh, the word of God uh, in the Old Testament uh, to, to, to the Persian language. And uh, so that is what, by the grace of God, he was able to do. And uh, he, uh, he began translating the Psalms first uh, from the Hebrew Masoretic text and then worked his way through the rest of the Old Testament by the assistance of uh, other Iranian helpers. He completed and he published his translation in 1845. And in uh, 1856, uh, William Glenn's Old Testament was joined with Henry Martin's um, New Testament uh, and was published by the British and Foreign Bible Society. And, uh, and it was, <clears throat> this was a high time in, in Persia or the Iran of that day for the Word of God. The final edition, which I have a copy of it here, was published in 1876. As you can see here, the, the, the Iranian version is not a pocket-sized edition, <laughs> but... Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, but still it is in existence. And actually, the one that I have here, it was published by the Iranian government. Uh, it has the mark of the Iranian state on it uh, with its promotion. It was published uh, for the use of the universities. And it was my father who was able to purchase these things uh, for me. And uh, at the beginning of it, it speaks about the corruption of the word of God, and it speaks about the, the, how that the Christians and the Jews have, have tampered with the word of God, and yet they say, since, like our authorized version, it 
standardized the text, the Persian text and the language at the time uh, and, and made it uniform, uh, then it is good for the students to have access to it. And so who can tell how many have read this and have been converted and have, God has used his word still to this day. But, dear friends, both Henry Martin and William Glenn did not see much by way of fruit of their labors. But in time, this bread that is cast upon the waters, this word of God that has been sown, has brought many hundreds and thousands of people uh, to know the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now we must move on to other influential people. Here is Canon Robert Bruce. He was an Anglican minister, an evangelical minister, who, uh, um, who <clears throat> was sent out by the Church Missionary Society, um, CMS, to India. He was a linguist. He was a godly man. He was an evangelical who also desired that the word of God would be brought to the um, Iranian people. Um, he felt it necessary at the time to, um, to revise the work of William Glenn and Henry Martin. Much of the work that he did was good. He, he did a good work of revision. Um, but we have to say, however. However, in the, as you know, in the 1800s, in the mid-1800s, there was the movement, the higher critical movement, and uh, the uh, work of Tischendorf had been published, and, uh, and there was a movement of uh, a critical movement regarding the Word of God and its authenticity, its, the manuscripts underlying it, and uh, sadly, Bruce was, was influenced by that German higher critical ideology. And so what you find in his revision work, he seems to uh, be very fluid. Sometimes he sticks to the received text, sometimes he doesn't. Uh, I cannot work out uh, what was his standards, by what means did he decide uh, which text should be included, which text should be removed. And, uh, and that in itself becomes a major issue even to our day. Uh, is the word of God subjective? Can we view the word of God in a subjective manner? As we were coming up, up here, I was speaking about the use of the New King James and its, its footnotes, where the New King James encourages people to the, by the use of the footnotes to, to, you can be your own textual critic. And if you think that text should not be there, then it's up to the reader to decide. Well, my friends, this is, this is very sad indeed, uh, for us to uh, play with the Word of God in such a way. Um, but <clears throat> um, I've had to, over the years, go through the, um, the New Testament of uh, Robert Bruce, and we have found uh, about 300 verses that have needed to be brought back to Henry Martin's text uh, because of the revision work that he, done, uh, he did. Yet to this day, uh, even though it's not always um, this, this um, Bible of uh, uh, Robert Bruce, it is, it, it is not always easy to read by, by Iranians of our day, but it remains the most accurate translation of the Persian Bible, and it is that that is the basis for the uh, revision and the translation that the Trinitarian Bible Society is undertaking. And it is the standard text. It is actually called the standard Bible in Persian, which has been used by all denominations, all Protestant denominations, and it is very much respected. So all these modern versions have come in the past few decades, but in matters of controversy, everyone says we need to go back to the old Bible, the standard text again. Let me say some things about the modern, <coughs> modern versions. Here, I don't think I have anything um, on that right now, but um, let me say something is about the uh, modern translations. In the past 30 
years, since the beginning of the new surge of interest in the Lord Jesus Christ in Iran, there has been a surge of modern versions of the Persian Bible as well. And sadly, the various translators and also publishers have tried to uh, make accessibility of language the priority rather than faithfulness to the original inspired texts from the Hebrew and the Greek received texts. They all have been based, of course, on the uh, critical text because they have, the funding has come uh, from those Bible societies around the world that support and promote the critical text uh, of, uh, let's say, the United Bible Society or the, uh, uh, the Wycliffe Bible Translators text, which, which are both eclectic texts. Uh, and so, therefore, those modern Persian translations are based upon those, those uh, Greek texts which were put together and promoted by unbelievers. I'm, I'm talking about Bruce Metzger. I'm talking to, about uh, Bart Ehrman. I'm talking about Kurt Allen, uh, who, with all of their scholarship, uh, they uh, deny the scripture. Uh, they deny the doctrines of the scripture and its inspiration and in, in its infallibility. How can you rely upon the work of such men who do not even believe in the text that they have collated and published? And, and also to think of how can you rely upon a text that is ever-changing the, um, this new uh, edition of the um, Elam Ministries um, New Millennium Version, which, is, um, which was supported by the Wycliffe Bible Translators, it has gone through a number of editions and revisions since 2000 and uh, the early 2000s when it was published, 2003, I believe, when it was first published. Um, and, and they have had to amend it. They've had to add to it. They've had to take away from it. They've had to put brackets uh, in it, uh, and they have had to remove brackets out of it. And, and they have said the places where we put brackets, the, those texts are part of the less reliable manuscripts. But you see, they have been forced to put those passages back in because some of the Iranians who were using the old standard version, they have said, this new Bible is, is undermining the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is undermining the, the fact that Christ is omnipresent and, and, and so on. And so they have been forced somewhat to do that, at least for those people who, who are um, um, used to the old Bible. And dear friends, yet this Bible and other modern Bibles that will come, and we are sure of, more Bibles coming. You see, it is a very lucrative business uh, when we uh, engage in such work. And, um, and yet, the scripture tells us this in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 21. It, it, the scripture says, My son, fear thou the Lord. That's what the TBS must do. Fear thou the Lord. We are not looking to men. We are not looking to these unbelieving scholars uh, for the work of God, but we look to the Lord, fearing God, and it says, and meddle not with them that are given to change. These Bibles, they come and go. They constantly are changing. Why? Because ultimately their, their whole philosophy uh, of their, their collated Greek text is ever-changing. So how can they keep to their to their uh, uh, Bibles, even the ESV. I know I'm going uh, uh, off-road here, but when they, when they said that we will uh, now publish uh, uh, the final edition of the ESV, within a weeks they had to retract that statement and say, we can't do that. Uh, their Bibles are ever changing, and we have to say we must not meddle with them that are given to change. A famous textual critic uh, who um, is actually, some of his works are being quoted and published within Iran itself. By who? By the Islamic uh, clerics 
in the city of Qom, which is the hub of uh, the training center for the Islamic clerics in Iran, they are, they are quoting Daniel Wallace, uh, who is a well-known textual critic. He claims to be an evangelical. And uh, Daniel Wallace, he, he said that we do not possess the complete word of God. And, and he says, he goes on to say even this, and even if we had it, we would not know that it was the complete word of God. We would not know it. This is an evangelical, a textual critic uh, that, that people are using um, to defend the cause of the modern textual criticism. My friends, this man does not believe even that we have the complete word of God. And, and the sad uh, thing is that, that the, uh, these modern texts, they, they, they think that these men are great. We, we must follow them because they wax eloquent about other doctrines of the scripture, then we should follow them still. Well, friends, uh, this has not brought about within this growing Iranian community growth in depth. And that is a very sad thing. There's been a growth numerically of people who claim to be Christians amongst Iranians, and, and I believe many of them are true believers. But in terms of the depth of doctrine and sound theology, they are not. And yet they are using, they are, they are being uh, fed these modern Bibles. Um, the same applies in English. The same applies in any language where the um, readability is promoted above faithfulness to the text of the Word of God. Um, <clears throat> the, the, these modern Bibles that are published in the past um, number of decades, they, as the English versions do, they remove um, hundreds of words and passages out of the Word of God, or they question it. They put brackets around it and the footnote. They question and say that the best uh, and oldest manuscripts do not contain these words, or, or the opposite, and that this word should be added uh, to such places. And so passages like the last 12 verses of Mark, passages like the woman caught in adultery, in John chapter 8, various doctrinal passages regarding the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, passages like the 1 John 5, 7 of the three heavenly witnesses, uh, they are removed. And many times there are not even a reference in the footnote. So, uh, friends, and, and what we find now in the Old Testament, now that the Old Testament of some of these modern texts have come out, what we find is that there is a random usage of the Septuagint. So they have moved away from the Hebrew text, which is inspired by the Word of God, and following uh, English Bibles, such as the ESV and the New American Standard Version, they are, they are copying uh, them and following the readings of the Septuagint, Greek translation. Um, <clears throat> And, and or they're placed in the margin, marginal footnotes. For example, if I give you a few examples from the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 47 and verse 21, we read this, and as for the people, he removed them to the cities. The new millennium version says, instead of saying he removed them from cities, he says he made servants of them. Now, how can you get that? He removed them from the cities, he made servants of them. They're two different, totally different meaning. Um, so do you see, if, when you move away from the inspired text, which is the Hebrew text, and you begin to play with these translations, um, the meaning of the word of God is changed. Or in Genesis 49 and verse 10, we read this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, which is a reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. And to him shall all the gathering, shall the gathering of the people be. Now the new 
Millennium Version, as well as the ESV and others, they say, until tribute comes to him. Until tribute comes to him. Shiloh is a name of Christ. And they, or they would say in the footnote, the Hebrew is not clear. So they get out of this to explain it, what they have done. The Hebrew is not clear. So we need the Greek. So many other passages that I, I could quote to you from the Old Testament <clears throat> of these modern Persian translations that either in the actual translated text or in the footnotes clearly there have been, has been a departure from the inspired Hebrew text and they've re relied much on the inferior translation of the Septuagint, uh, which includes the, the apocryphal books as well. So the impression that we are given by these translators, by these Bible publishers and businessmen, I would say, is uh, the impression that we are given that we cannot know for sure what the text of a scripture is. We cannot know for sure. And do you know, this plays right into the hands of these Islamic clerics. They're apologists in Iran. And, and, and they publish it online. You, you can go under hundreds of pages that they are rehashing the words of Daniel Wallace and such men to say, look, even these Protestant um, scholars are saying that they do not know what Bible they have. They do not know if this is the word of God. And, and so the situation gets, gets worse and worse when you come to the New Testament, where these modern Bibles have put their trust in the fluid and ever-changing United Bible Society and the eclectic Wycliffe Bible translator's Greek text. Uh, of course, there are many, many um, um, godly people amongst these people, uh, these um, societies too, and genuine people who want to serve the Lord. Uh, they may be misguided, so we are not speaking ill of these people, but we are, we are criticizing and we are wanting to think critically of the text and the methodology that they use. But we have documented uh, over 700 verses that supposedly the more accurate and reliable uh, uh, text of a scripture do not have them or have, have changed them. This is uh, the, the new millennium version that is now very much promoted uh, in and out of Iran for the use of the masses. And, uh, and, and that is very sad. I, I have seen um, um, websites where this, um, uh, this Bible has been, um, has been used to show, look at these footnotes, look at these Christians. They're wanting to promote a text upon us and they do not even know if they have the word of God. And they say, but look at our Quran. Our Quran doesn't have these footnotes. We do not criticize our Quran, and so on. My friends, this is very, very sad. But when you think about the passages that are, that are changed, it is the same argument as when we seek to show people about our authorized version we can use for the um, Persian uh, Bibles and especially the modern Bibles uh, that, that it is not uh, words such as is or the or and that are removed but very much so the doctrinal expressions uh, that are removed which I want to just highlight some that re refers to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ a clear text that is used for, with, all new, with all Unitarians, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Muslims. We can use 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The new millennium version and other versions say he appeared in a body. Now, in the latest edition, they put a footnote. Or it could be translated as God. So, because they have been now pressurized and forced to insert it in 
they, they put it in the footnote. So God is now placed in the footnote. The deity of Christ is replaced in that way. Or in Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, where our, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus, is left out. You see, the, the demons in that passage bore witness of the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. That, that the name of Christ is left out. He was an, an identifiable, and that name of Jesus is the identification of, of his humanity as the Son of God in his deity. And the demons trembled before him, and they said, Jesus, the Son of God. They saw him as both man and God in one person. And yet, these revisers would not have us see it. And it affects the person, the doctrine of the person of Christ. We could see the, the opposite of it in, in Matthew 28 and verse 6, where the term, the Lord, so there, Jesus is removed, is the identification of his, day, his humanity, but then in other passages, like in Matthew 28 and verse 6, his deity is removed, the Lord is omitted. The very reverent angels said, see the place where the Lord lay. And in, in, in Farsi, it is very emphatic. When you translate the word, the Lord, there, there is only one way to translate it. It has to be God. It has to say, see the, the place the, the, the creator God lay. And, um, but that is now taken out. It, it simply says, see the place where he lay. The constant attempt to humanize the Lord Jesus Christ and take away from his deity does not endear the, their Greek text um, to believers. We could quote so many passages such as John chapter 1 and verse 18 where that theological statement, the only begotten son, is footnoted. And, and it is translated, the only begotten God. Uh, and to, to put those words in doubt and place such a phrase in, in foreign, which is foreign to Scripture. And you see, such manipulations, it, it accommodates the Arian, the um, Unitarian teaching that Christ was lesser deity created by God. It agrees with the teaching of Oregon, that Christ was not equal with God in essence and nature. Uh, and, and so, dear friends, sound fundamental doctrines concerning Christ, um, it, is, it is diminished, it is downgraded. And uh, we, could, we could go on. I, I mentioned about Christ's omnipresence. And there is one clear text in the Gospel according to John in chapter 3 and verse 13 where the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about himself being in heaven, who has come down from heaven. And then he finishes that verse by saying, which is in heaven, present tense. And this is omitted. Uh, it is omitted in the first version of this, but then uh, the, the, the uh, revisers came under pressure by people like myself, uh, criticizing them, and they were forced to put it in. What kind of Bible is it that constantly have to change like this, uh, dear friends. And so we've mentioned only a sample of these things. And, um, and we, we, I want to say some things now uh, about the methodology of translation. And our brother Bill Greendike, I'm sure he will touch on these things and he will go into further depths. But, <clears throat> but the, the modern Bibles, like so many of them now in different languages, they use a, a methodology which is very much modern, and that is what is called dynamic equivalence form of translation. But the, uh, the, the Bible that Henry Martin, William Glenn, and even Robert Bruce translated, they believed in formal equivalency uh, of translation. And, uh, uh, and, and I won't go into so much detail on this, but to say this, all of this, uh, all of these things are alarming issues as we try to reach the hearts of Muslims 
who have been fed from a young age that Christians and, and Jews have, have corrupted their text. And, uh, and so uh, the, the modern versions have become an ammunition in the hands of these Islamic clerics who are, as I say, with their own money, they're publishing Alistair McGrath's work and quoting from it in the city of Qom to, to defend their cause that it's not just the Muslim fundamentalists who are saying these things, but evangelical Protestants are saying the same. And so, <clears throat> dear friends, uh, this has urged the need for the revision project by the Trinitarian Bible Society. Um, uh, and uh, it was in 2001 in Ipswich when um, I, was a, I was a young boy who um, uh, attended, a, uh, attended a Bible study at, at a church there. And I was told that there is a man coming who thinks like you, uh, I was told by the elders. Because you see, I had, been, I had been adamant that the authorized version should be used from the pulpit. The elders were criticizing the text of the scripture and saying the, the AV is wrong on this. And uh, so this man by, uh, that you know, Dr. David Allen, he, he came and he spoke about the work of the society and I was so moved by it. And I thought to myself, why, why don't we, why don't the Persian speakers have a Bible similar to the authorized version? And so I approached him and I said very naively, uh, doesn't the TBS have a project on this? And he said, no, because we have nobody to, to do this. And he said, well, what about you? Uh, and at, at the time, I, I, I um, was um, very humbled by it, and I, I left it in the background and prayed about these things, and the Lord has brought about things since then. But dear friends, the translation and the revision work of God has led to first the publication of the gospel according to John, and then um, in 2019, the publication of the uh, whole of the New Testament based on the received text. And so after, uh, well, since the publication of Henry Martin's 1812 edition, no Bible after that contained words such as what we find in 1 John 5, 7, where we read that, that there, for the, there are three um, witnesses, heavenly witnesses, and these three are one, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three were, are one. That, that text was completely removed. And, uh, and so now Iranians can read that. They can read the words such as God was manifest in the flesh without any critical footnotes. There are no brackets. There are no um, uh, removal of any of these passages. But uh, friends, uh, we must continue to pray for this work. The, um, the, the work of the Old Testament continues to, uh, to be and uh, we continue to take steps forward. And it is not an easy task. It is not an easy task in, in my other responsibilities uh, that I have. But let me, um, let me encourage you, uh, dear friends, with, <clears throat> with something that I said earlier on. And with these things, I will finish. The Lord continues to sovereignly be at work. Um, we, the Lord is not sitting upon his throne, and I'm speaking reverently here, wringing his hand, worried about his word, worried about his church, worried of what will happen. The matter has already been written. It is as, as good as done. It's spoken in past tense of what God will do in this world for his church and for his glory. And, and he has given us this, this sharp word, a two-edged sword. And, and this two-edged sword must be translated and must be taken. This, this sword is to be multiplied into as many languages of the world as possibly can. But, but the sharpness of it uh, cannot be blunted. 
Um, it, it, it must not be something that will rust and has to be renewed again. And, and so let me quote to you from John Bunyan's character, Mr. Great, Greatheart. I'm sure you have, you have read this, and I'm sure it has entered into your mind and of the, the man valiant for truth. This man valiant for truth, he had a sword. And, and uh, uh, it is an, a, a helpful um, comparison that we could make. I'll, I'll quote you from Bunyan's work. He says, Great Heart said this. He said, Great Heart to Mr. Valiant for Truth. Thou hast worthily behaved thyself. Let me see thy sword. So he showed it him when he had taken it in his hand and looked thereon a while. He said, Ha! It is right Jerusalem blade, he says. Quoting from Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 3, Valiant said this, It is so. Let a man have one of these blades with a hand to wield it and skill to use it, and he may venture upon an angel with it. He need not fear its holding if he can but tell how to lay on. Its edges will never blunt. It will cut flesh and bones and soul and spirit and all. Dear friends, this is the Bible that we have. This is the word of God that is now, uh, the New Testament of it is being translated. So it has one, one edge. This, this, this double-edged sword, it has one very sharp edge, which is cutting deep into the recesses of the Islamic soul. But it needs another edge to it as well. It is being sharpened. It is being prepared and by the grace of God to be uh, produced and published, God willing, in time to come. But dear friends, this and production of this, I'll uh, just move on to, uh, to the cost of this. There, there are individuals who have helped. These individuals, I will, uh, you can only see their pictures. They've paid great prices. This man was imprisoned for two years in Iran for helping in the first revision of the, uh, John's Gospel. Um, and, and these others who have also helped greatly, and I could mention other names um, of them, but there's been a great, great cost um, that has gone into this, not the cost of money, but the, the lives of these individuals, dear friends. And so we ought to remember, remember the, the work, of, work of God. I'll, I'll finish with this quotation of Henry Martin. It is his prayer. Increase my zeal that though I am but a feeble and obscure instrument, I may struggle out my few days in great and unremitting exertions for the demolition of paganism and the setting up of Christ's kingdom. This is what we are about. This is the work that we are called to do. And the demolition of the kingdom of Satan... It comes through the sword of the Spirit. And God will bless it, dear friends. So be encouraged. God is at work. And I did not even mention about the printer in Iran who is now saying, I am waiting for you to, to, to support in the publishing of the New Testament. I'll, I'll finish with this. I did say I'll finish, I'll finish with this one. Um, <laughs> this man contacted us two weeks ago. And uh, I've already communicated with uh, the um, friends at the TBS. He said, I've received a, a large portion of what we call in Iran Quran, Quranic paper. This is the uh, Bible paper, the thin paper that we use. In Iran, we say Quranic paper. And he says, I am, and, and it's the government who tracks all of this. How much is used, who is using it, and so on. He says, I am willing to switch the files uh, at, at the printers. So instead of them uh, printing the Quran, we would print a New Testament. Uh, my friend, this is a man who, who is very disillusioned. He said, I would want to print anything other than Islamic literature. Now, who is at work here? It is only the work of God. So, so dear friends, this, what we read in Acts chapter 2 it is the, the great work of God 
is being done here, and God is blessing it to the ends of the world. May God be praised and our Lord Jesus Christ be glorified. Amen.